chapter 10 of John, we see there were certain Jews that tried to capture and stone and kill Jesus and probably their disciples. So the disciples had a little bit of fear. Are you with me? Right? They were concerned for their life and for Jesus' life, but Jesus makes it clear. He said, guys, we're going to be safe. So they start making their way. And these sisters, they sent for Jesus, but then they waited. And they waited. And they waited. And then one day, it was too late. Jesus, in their minds, did not make it back to them in time. By the time Jesus arrived, Lazarus had been dead for four days. But Jesus already knew this before he got there. He knew that Lazarus had died because it says in verse 14, So Jesus then said to his disciples plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sake that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go see him. And then in verse 17, we see Jesus come to where Mary and Martha are and where the others are and what they're grieving. I think this is a, a great picture, an example of Jesus entering into our brokenness, church. Entering into our loss and, and grief and our pain. He enters into their life. And when he does, he shows them who he is and what he brings into their life. Today as we celebrate Easter, we celebrate Jesus coming to be with us. That's who Jesus is. Jesus isn't an angel. Jesus isn't somebody that earned his way God. No, Jesus is God, sir. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He has been and always will be God. And he came to be with us. He came to love us and to lead us and to show us who he is and, and what he brings into our life. We're going to see that, that Jesus didn't come just to be a good man. He didn't come just to be a good teacher. But if he came as God in the flesh, he came to be our Lord. That means our boss, church. He came to be in charge and to be our risen Savior. He came to be all that you and I and everybody else would ever need. As we look at our passage today, I think we're going to see not only who Jesus is, but I think we're going to see that he brings three things with him. Jesus comes to be with them and to bring three things into their life. And they're the same thing, church, that he brings with him into your life and into my life. So let's begin in verse 17 and see what these three things are. The first thing that we see Jesus bring into their brokenness and into their hurt and their pain and their life is this, it's love and compassion. Jesus brings love and compassion into their life and Jesus brings love and compassion into our lives. Jesus steps into their brokenness. Church, he steps into your brokenness. He steps into your life with his love and compassion. Look at verse 17. It says this, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. And so Mary, she, excuse me, Martha jumps up and she runs to Jesus and she's weeping. She's broken. She's hurting. Why? Because her brother had just died. If you've lost someone, you can relate to that. But I also think it would be fair to say that she's also weeping because she sent for Jesus and he didn't show up in time. But he's here. He's here now, and Martha comes running to Jesus in tears because it's too late. Her brother is gone. She knew Jesus could have healed him. She knew who Jesus was, and in her mind, Jesus just didn't get there in time. Look at what it says in verse 21. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, just imagine this through tears and through brokenness. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Then in verse 28, Martha goes to get her sister Mary, and it says she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here, and he's calling for you. And as soon as Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Verse 32, as soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Word for word, what her sister had just said to Jesus this statement to Jesus, Lord, if you were here, he would still be alive. I think, I think it showed that they trusted in who Jesus was and what he could do. But how great is it, church, 
that we can come to Jesus with our fears, with our pain, with our brokenness, with our tears, and notice how Jesus responds. And this is huge, church. Notice how Jesus responds. He doesn't say, hey, chill out, ladies. I'm God. Calm down. Right? He doesn't say, don't worry. Be patient. You'll see what happens. I think it's important to see exactly what Jesus does in the midst of their brokenness. In verse 33, it says, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her were crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. And then verse 34, Jesus says, where have you put him? Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus was still a little ways away from where Lazarus had been placed in this tomb. But this action here, it shows us that Jesus, church, don't miss this. Jesus doesn't stay at a distance. He draws near. He comes to them. He's with them in their grief. He's with them in their suffering. He's with them in their anger. He's with them in their lack of understanding. He's with them when someone has died. He's with them in their brokenness. One of the biggest misunderstandings I think that we have in our world today of who God is, is this, is that God, that Jesus is distant, that he's far away just looking down on us, but that's not who he is at all, church. He is with us. He knows you. He cares for you. He hears you. He is personal. In fact, Jesus' last words on those who trust him as their Savior were this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But notice it says that when Jesus saw the sisters, when he saw that the crowd was crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. I think we see a couple things here. John, when writing this, I think he used this, I know he used this phrase on purpose. The phrase that Jesus was deeply moved and troubled, it's an important phrase. To be deeply moved, it carries two different meanings. It carries the meaning that we, we would just read, like, like he's deeply moved. He's affected with emotion. He's affected with passion. He's affected with love. Jesus is responding to their pain and to their tears. You ever walked in on someone that is just broken and crying, and you walk in, and you just respond, and you, are you, are you with me, church, right? You, you're moved deeply. He's giving proof that he cares about them. But the other meaning of this phrase, deeply moved, it also means to be filled with anger and outrage. And it makes perfect, perfectly good sense. Jesus' response, being deeply moved, is real. He loves them. He cares for them. He hurts with them. But I think, church, that there's also this very real anger at the pain and the fear and the grief that death causes. And the doubt that death causes. I think he's angry about that. Jesus knows, church, that he's about to remove their pain. He's about to defeat death, church. But in that moment, they are hurting. They are broken. They are weeping because of the sting of death. And so Jesus responds with a deep compassion for them. He responds with a real love toward them. Church, as Christians, Jesus is our example. Amen? Romans chapter 12, verse 15, God's word is telling us that we're to, we're to be one and we're to love one another and we're to be there for one another. In verse 15, it says that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice. But then it says that we're to weep with those who weep. I think it can be easy, church, to rejoice and celebrate with others. I think it's easier to be there for them when things are going well. Right? Right? It's easy for people to be with you when things are going well. It's easy for you to be with them when, when things are going well. But real love is proven when we are willing to be with someone in their hurt, in their mess, in their pain, in their tears, and weep with them. And so here with these sisters in this crowd, they are weeping. They are real tears, and Jesus is deeply moved. And then in verse 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, it says, Jesus wept. That's what real love and compassion looks like. He's there with them. He's hurting with them. He's feeling what they feel. Church, love and compassion hurts with those who hurt and weeps with those who weep. And here is Jesus, God in the flesh, weeping with those he cares about. He knows, church, that everything is about to change. He knows that everything is going to be okay. 
But in this moment, Jesus is showing us that when we hurt, he sees us and he hurts with us. I don't know everyone in your story, but at some point in your life, if you've lived for 10 minutes, you've probably experienced hurt and grief and brokenness. You've experienced loneliness. Maybe you've been abused. Maybe you've been betrayed. Maybe someone has let you down or abandoned you. You may be experiencing disappointment. Maybe you're struggling today with anxiety or depression. It may be the loss of someone that you love deeply. And maybe others were there to be with you. And praise God for those people. But maybe when those things were going along or right now, you feel alone, right? You really need someone in this moment and you feel alone. I can tell you this today, church, in these moments and in every moment of your life, But in your hurt, in your tears, in your brokenness, in your loneliness, Jesus' love is there with you. His love for you is real. His love for you is perfect. He loves you like no one else can. I have a deep love for my wife. She has a deep love for me, but no one can love she and I like the Lord can. Today we're celebrating his love for us. He saw, church, he saw our brokenness. His love led him to give his very life for us. Jesus brings love and compassion to you, and his love is real. His love is perfect. In fact, not only does he bring you his love, but church, Jesus is love. Jesus is love. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. Jesus, God in the flesh, is love. And so here Jesus comes to be with these people that he loves and to bring him his love and compassion into their lives. Today we celebrate that Jesus came to be Emmanuel, to come into our lives, to be with us. And he brought his love and compassion into our life. The next thing we see is this, that Jesus brings, he brings love and compassion. The next thing that Jesus brings is truth. Jesus brings truth into our lives. Jesus brings truth into our lives. I hope I don't step on any toes here, but I'm not too worried about it. I think this is great news, especially in the world we live in today. What we call truth seems to change day by day. If we're not seeing it, church, we're not looking. Truth seems to differ depending on what station you watch, the person you listen to, the person that you're hanging out with, the way that you feel that day. Absolute truth is being challenged. But Jesus brings real truth into his life. And the truth that he's about to bring is probably the most important truth that you will ever know. Look at what happens back in verse 21. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then Mary says the same thing. They were believing that death was the end, that that death gets the last word, that death is the enemy that could not be beaten. But remember what Jesus says back in verse 4, kind of that weird response. This sickness will not end in death. But it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified. The Son of God is Jesus, may be glorified through it. Jesus is saying, it's not true. Death will not get the last word. Death will not be the end. But they say to Jesus, if you would have been here, Jesus, Lazarus would not have died. But listen to Jesus' response. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he or she dies, will live. Verse 26, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? The world tells us, church, that death is the end. That there's no more existence after that. The world teaches that you only live once. You have 70 to 100 years here, so live them however you want. When we believe the lie that death is the end, it changes how we live. We, we start living for the here and now because that's it. Why live for anything else? And so that's what we do. We find ourselves living for the things of this world. We live for the promotion. We live for sex. We live for more and more money. We live for the American dream. We live for more pleasure. We live for ourselves. We live for the bigger house. We live for the bigger... Are you with me, church? Why? Because we buy into the lie that this is all there is. Why not not go out with a bang? 
Church, when we think about death, of course there's going to be grief. Of course there's going to be pain and loss when someone that we love has passed away. But too often the pain and the hurt are worse because we have bought into the lie that death is the end. I have sat by people that were dying and I'm sitting there with their family and there's a difference, church. There's a difference in two different types of people. One that believes that death is the end and one that knows that Jesus gets the final word. Jesus turns all of those lies upside down with this truth. He says, I get the last word even over death. He says, I am the resurrection. Not just I will resurrect you, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He says, those who believe in me, those who believe in who I am, those who believe that I'm going to defeat death and that I am God, that I am Lord and that I am Savior. Those who believe in me, Jesus says, even if you die, you will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And so Jesus brings love and compassion. And then he brings this truth. And look at what Jesus does in verse 38. He shows them that he's the truth. He shows them that what he says is true. There's a lot of people that say a lot of things, but when they get the opportunity to live it out, right, Jesus is going to show it. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Verse 39, remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there is already a stench because he has been in there four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Then in verse 43, after Jesus prays to God the Father, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. When I think about this miracle, when I think about what Jesus does here, we might think that Jesus brought Lazarus back to life to remove the grief of those who were hurting. And if you've ever lost someone, you would would say, I would like that. That would be a good thing. But this miracle is much bigger than only removing their grief. This miracle was to bring God glory. This miracle was to show that Jesus was, in fact, who he said he was. That he is the resurrection and the life. This miracle, bringing Lazarus back to life after being dead for four days, church, here's what Jesus is showing. He's showing that Jesus has power over death. He alone, church, is the resurrection and the life. Resurrection means to be raised to life again. And this word life, it not only speaks of our life here and now, but it also speaks of eternal life. We see that Lazarus' physical death, he died due to a sickness. But when we think of eternal life and eternal death, we suffer that because of a sickness. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6 what causes our spiritual death. And it's, it's a sickness that every single one of us deal with. And the sickness, church, is sin. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Here's what that means. Our actions deserve death. What we have done deserves death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice it doesn't say, but the gift of God is is more money. Or a better body, or a better girlfriend, or a boyfriend, or a better, are you with me, church? A bigger house. It's not, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And when we think about the word death, let's think about it more simply. The word death really speaks of separation. When we experience death in this world, we are saddened because someone we know is separated from us. They're separated from this world as we know it. Death brings separation from this physical life. But the same is true of eternal and spiritual death. Because of sin, the death is separation from God. Church, we were made to be with God. We were made to follow God, to trust God, to listen to God, to pray to God. Are you with me, church? We were made to do life with him. But our sin causes separation. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. Church, your sin, my sin is a problem. 
It's a reality that every single one of us face and deal with. And it separates us from the God who made us and loves us. But looking at Romans 6, it says that the gift of God. Let's pause there for a moment. There's a lot of other false religions out there. And in their religions, it's all about what they do to earn God, what they can do. Are you with me, church? How can you please this God? But this says that (laughs) while we were sinners, God has given us a gift. And the gift is eternal life. Who is eternal life in? It's, It's in Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus is saying saying and showing us in our passage today, that in him there is life. He is the giver of life. Church, money will never satisfy you. The bigger house will never satisfy you. Another drink will never satisfy you. A, A promotion will never satisfy you. Jesus is the giver of life, church. Sin causes death, but he raises us back to life. And I love this. When Jesus says that he is the life, don't miss this. It's not that he just brings life. He is the life. And so he's saying that when you belong to me, Jesus says, when you believe in Jesus, when you believe that he is your Lord and Savior, you have him and you have life. And that's where Jesus turns everything upside down. We live in a broken and sinful world. We all face a physical death. My dad, growing up, said there's two things you got to do. You got to pay your taxes and, and you got to die, right? Everyone pays their taxes, everyone dies. But in Jesus, physical death is not the end. Why? Because our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, gets the last word. And that truth, it changes how we live. But it also changes how we grieve. If you, if you lose someone, right? If you know that they trusted in Jesus, if they were saved by Jesus, if they received the gift of eternal life through Jesus, grieving changes. Because we know that they, we will see them again. We know that they're in the best place possible. They're no longer hurting. They're no longer living in this mess that we're living in. They're with Jesus. And so we can celebrate. For you and me, death doesn't have to have the last word. You don't have to fear death. Because if you believe in Jesus, if you believe that he can save you and forgive you of your sins, then death does not get the last word in your life. Jesus does. And we will be with him for eternity. We'll be with our loved ones who trusted in Jesus for eternity. I lost my grandpa 20-some years ago. I lost my second grandpa last year. I lost my my grandma recently. I'm going to see them again, church. Why? Because they knew Jesus. Not because they were good enough. Not because they were rich enough. Simply because they knew Jesus. And so Jesus came into their lives, and he comes into our lives, and he brings real love and compassion. He brings truth absolute truth. And last is this. Jesus brings an invitation into our lives. Jesus is inviting us, church. He's inviting you to believe in who he is. He's inviting you to believe in his truth. He's inviting you to receive his love and compassion. He's inviting you to receive the gift of eternal life. He is inviting you and me to fully, with all of our heart, believe in him and to trust in him and to call him the Lord of your life. Jesus says the truth. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he says this, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Not did your grandma or grandpa believe it. Not does your your mom or daddy believe it. Not does your wife or your husband or your kids believe it. Do you believe this? This is his invitation for you and me to believe in Jesus. It's a personal invitation to follow Jesus, to place your life in his hands, to place your eternal life in him. Romans 10, chapter 9 tells us how do we respond to this invitation. Romans 10, 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth, what? Jesus is Lord. 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be rescued. You will be his forever. Saved from what? Saved from our sins. Saved to have eternal life with Jesus, no longer separated from God, brought back into a relationship with our creator forever. Today, as we think about Jesus being arrested, being beaten beyond recognition, hanging on the cross where he bled and died. Jesus did that. Why? He died for you and me, church. He showed his love. The Bible tells us that that, that God didn't just say he loves us. He says he proved his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get our act together. That's why there's a difference between a relationship with Jesus and religion. You can't earn Jesus. Have you sinned once? You can't earn Jesus. Jesus says, I got you. I got you. I'll bring you back into a relationship. Jesus did that. He died for you and me. He showed his love and compassion for us on the cross, carrying our sin and our shame. 1 Corinthians 15.3 says that Christ died for our sins. Right here on my pulpit, there's a, it's carved in here and it says, to tell us die. It is finished. He died once for all. You trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It is finished, church. You are forgiven. Your debt is paid. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself, Jesus, bore your sins and my sins in his body on the tree, on the cross, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. Why? By his wounds, you have been healed. Through his sacrifice, through his wounds, through his death on the cross, we can be healed and saved from the spiritual disease of sin. Jesus came to save us from our sins, church, but he also came to give us eternal life. And that's what we celebrate today, that after Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, and on the third day, just as he said he would, he rose again. Church, death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. He has all the power over everything, including death. And I love how Mary Martha responds to his invitation. Jesus says this, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And her reply says it all. Verse 27, yes, Lord. It's that simple. Yes, Lord. I believe you are the Messiah. The Messiah means the Christ, the promised one that God the Father promised to send into this world to save you and me from our brokenness and our sin. Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Christ, my Savior. I believe you are the Son of God who comes into the world. She's saying, I believe you are the promised one who came to take away my sins. I believe in you. The most important question for you to answer today is this. Not are you religious? Are you good enough? Can you buy your way in when you stand at the gate? Will St. Peter let you in? None of that's in the Bible, church. None of that's in the Bible. Do you believe in Jesus? That's the question. Do you believe in Jesus? Have you called on Jesus to save you and to give you eternal life? Not long after this, Jesus made his way to the cross, to the place where he would give his life for you and for me. And in Matthew 28, Jesus had been crucified. They buried him. On the third day, we see the truth of who Jesus is. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the view of the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they were, became like dead men. The angel stood or the angel told the woman, don't be afraid because I know who you are looking for. Jesus who was crucified. Church, he is not here for he is risen just as he said he was. Come and see the place where they laid him. Jesus came to be with you. He came to love you. He came to bring you truth. And the truth is Jesus is the resurrection and he's the life. And if you believe and trust in Jesus today to be your Lord and Savior, he promises to forgive you of your sins. Even the ones nobody knows about. He promises to take away your shame, church. He makes it so that death is not the end. You can know for sure that when you leave this world that you will be with him for eternity. 
And you can know that by your answer to this question. Do you believe? Church, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your head, just a moment of response. And I'm going to talk to those in here today, those that are online that would say, you know what? I've been pursuing all sorts of things in this world, but I've not pursued Jesus. I've not received his love. I've not received his compassion. I've not received his truth. I've not received his invitation. I've not answered the question, do you believe? If that's you today, church, what better day to give your life to Jesus, to surrender your life to Jesus, than on the day that we celebrate that he rose again for you? If you're here today and you say, you know what? I've never confessed Jesus as the boss of my life. I've never surrendered my life to Jesus, never called on Jesus to save me. I've never believed with all of my heart that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. I've never received the gift of eternal life. If that's you today, there's no, uh, there's no better day, church, than right now. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I do want you to lift your hand up and say, today I want to give my life to Jesus. I want him to step into my life. I want him to heal my brokenness. I want him to forgive me of my sins. I want him to meet me where I am so that I can follow him and spend eternity with him. I want to know that if I die today, I'm going to be with him for eternity. If that's you today, would you slip your hand up? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to have you walk up. I just want you to, I just want to see your hand. For all of us in here today, if we have trusted in Jesus, does our life reflect that? Are we with his people on a regular basis? Are we in his word on a regular basis? Are we in prayer with him on a regular basis? Are we living for him on a regular basis? Easter's the day for us to have that, that relighting of fire within us to say, man, Jesus did this for me. I could spend some time with him. I could spend some time with his people in church. I can spend some time in the word and in prayer. I can live my life for him. I want to give you a, a moment of give you a moment to spend time with the Lord. And I want to ask one more time, if someone's in here today that says, I do not know Jesus and I want to give my life to Jesus, would you lift your hand up? I see your hand. If you're online, email me, jump on the chat and just say, I need Jesus. We'll get a hold of you today. If you're in here today and you say, you know what? I need Jesus. I need him to forgive me of my sins. I need his gift of eternal life. I need to be with him forever. I've tried everything on my own. I'm going to give my life to Jesus and let him be in charge. If your hand's up, you can put that down. If that's you today and said, this is what I want to do. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Then I need you to repeat after me. But it's not the prayer, church. It's not the prayer. It's does your heart believe it? Are you truly surrendering? It's not just about repeating after someone. It's about do you really believe what we're saying? And so I'm going to say a prayer here in just a minute. And if you truly want to ask Jesus to save you, then you can repeat after me. Dear God in heaven, I know that you love me. I know that you came to save me from my sins. I know that you were beaten and abused and mocked in my place. I know that you hung on the cross and bled and died for me and my sins. But I also know that you rose again just as you said you would. So that I can have eternal life with you forever. Jesus, right now I confess my sin to you. I know I'm a sinner. Help me turn from that. And I turn to you, Jesus. Be my Lord. Be my boss. Be my Savior. I believe in you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. God, we pause in this moment and we thank you, God, that anybody that, that prayed that and surrendered their life to you, we celebrate that. The Bible says that it's just one gives their life to Jesus, all of heaven is celebrating. And God, I pray, Lord, that heaven doesn't stop celebrating all day today. 
I pray for those that prayed that and believe that in their heart. They're responding to Jesus. I pray, Lord, that they would come and, and connect with me right afterwards. We'll, we'll help them. We'll pray with them. We'll rejoice with them. We'll get excited with them. We'll get them whatever they need, God. Thank you for saving people today. Thank you for saving people. It, you're going to keep doing that, God. You are, you are in the life-saving, changing business. We love you. God, As we, if we are Christians in here today, help us follow you. Help us trust you. Help us be with your people. Help us be in your word. Help us be in prayer. Help us trust you in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said.